Shalom, shalom. The peace of God be with you. My name is Father Mitchell Pacwa. I'm a Jesuit priest and I teach Old Testament at Loyola University in Chicago. In the series on the prophets, we're now looking at the prophet Isaiah. And we've taken a start to look at this second part of the book of the prophet, beginning with chapter 2, verse 6. And it extends from there to chapter 4, verse 6. Now today we're going to start off with chapter 3 and get to chapter 4 as well. So open up your Bibles with me, if you would. This section is hard to date. I myself suspect that it's from sometime in the 340s, excuse me, 740s B.C. 740s B.C. Before King Uzziah has died. It's a time of general well-being and wealth in Judah. People are doing pretty well. This is, the economy is prospering. The military has done pretty well so far because King Uzziah is a pretty effective administrator, a pretty effective king. But he's not a righteous one. Nor is his society a righteous society. And so let's see what, what the prophet has to say. In chapters 3 and up to chapter 4, verse 1, we see how Isaiah describes the disintegration of his society. Things are falling apart at all levels of society. So he says here, in verses 1 through 9 of chapter 3, he says that society is crumbling. It supports systems. And leadership are falling apart. For he says, Kihine, Hazon Yavetzavaot. Behold, that the Lord, Yahweh of hosts, takes away from Jerusalem and from Judah, not just from the city, the capital, but from the whole of their society, the stay and the staff. Now the word, Mashain, Umashaina, are a masculine and a feminine word meaning the same thing. A staff of some kind. A masculine word for it and a feminine word for it. Why two words? Well, a good possibility is that by describing the masculine and the feminine, he means to say the whole of society because masculine and feminine are two sides of the whole picture. huh? So he's probably referring to that whole of society's support systems that stay in its staff because a staff is something that you use to hold yourself up and protect yourself with if, you, you know, if you're going for a walk for instance and there might be dogs or some other critters around there you take that staff and you whack them over the nose with it and so it protects you and all of that protection and support is going to be removed from Jerusalem the capital and the nation of Judah Every staff of bread and every stay of water. Now here's the same word, mish'an, mish'an. What's a staff of bread about? It's something that I saw in Jerusalem one of the times I was there. Where you, men walk around, sometimes women have them, usually men, with a large staff and on it will be round breads. And they have a whole series of these round breads and you hold them by a stick. And you sell them off the stick, the first one off the top, okay? So that's probably what they mean. You know, carrying around these breads with, with the staves with breads around it. But not only will bread and water, the very necessities of life, be taken away, so also will, as it says here, the warrior and the man of war. Now what's the difference? Probably the warrior, Gibor, means the mercenary, the professional soldier. Someone who's paid by the king to be always around. Whereas the Ish Mechama, the, the, the man of war, means somebody who was part of the militia. The, sometimes the whole population would gather up arms to fight against incoming enemies. That'd be the militia. So that's going to be taken away. The Shofet Navi, the judge and the prophet. These are the ones who 
speak the word of God. The prophet speaks directly what God tells the prophet and the judge gives the decisions for everyday life that come from God's law. And those who interpret the law and give God sense and meaning to life are going to be taken away. Religious leaders are going to be removed. The diviner and the elder. These are two more support systems. The diviner would be those people who seek counsel from spirits or who use divination like Ouija boards or tarot cards or astrology is used today. So that's an illegitimate kind of person. An illegitimate source of wisdom or understanding and advice. That's going to be removed. And so is the elder who has the wisdom of age. That's going to be removed. People won't listen to the old people anymore. The captain of 50 and the prince of face is what it literally says. All right? that means the prince of face means the prince who has some sort of rank. He's going to be removed and so is the captain or the, or the, the leader of 50. So uh, some sort of a military leader who has 50 men under him. And the counselor and the cunning charmer and the skillful enchanter. Now, the counselor would be someone who's professional, government secretary of some sort, like we would have a, the, our cabinet for our president, who would be counseling him. They're going to be removed. And also, those who are cunning charmers and skillful enchanters, those who are also skillful in using different forms of conjuring up spirits or some other forms of magic, they're going to be removed. The other illegitimate means of getting wisdom, those are going to be removed. Instead, he says in verse 4, I will give children, I'll make children their princes, and babies shall rule over them. That is, instead of having the old and the wise, Babies who don't know anything. And isn't that part of being young is to be stupid? And at least that's what I was when I was young. Most of us are dumb when we're young. We just don't have any experience. That's part of just being young. And those young babies without experience are going to be the ones who rule. Have you ever seen kids who try to boss each other around? They can be little tyrants. As a matter of fact, we sometimes think of tyrants as being like little babies. And so the Lord is saying, that's what I'm going to give instead because of your sins. And the people shall oppress one another. Everybody will oppress his neighbor and his fellow citizen. And the child shall behave insolently against the aged. And those who are lowborn shall behave badly against those who are honorable. That society is going to be totally topsy-turvy. People are going to sass and talk back, and be arrogant, and society's going to crumble. That's what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. Now, we're going to come back to see what else Isaiah has to say about that day, so please stay with us. Welcome back. We're going through this prophecy of Isaiah where he describes the crumbling disintegration of his society in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and Judah. And he says that things are so bad that in verse 6, people will say, look, you have a coat, you have a mantle, which the translation might say, you be our ruler. In other words, if you're smart enough to even keep your coat, then you're smart enough to be our ruler. In other words, things will be so bad and society will disintegrate so much that just to be able to hang on to your clothes will mean that you're pretty smart. And it will also say, let this ruin be under your hand. What do they mean by that? In other words, the ruin of this city will be so bad it can be under your hand. That is, you can rule it because you're smart enough to keep on to your coat. But on that day he shall swear. In other words, it will be so bad that he'll then say, I will not be a healer. I will not bind you up. Because that's what the word for healer is. It's one who binds. I will not be a binder. Because in my house there's neither bread nor a coat. 
I don't really have anything. Don't make me your king. I don't want to be the ruler. Now, in normal times, people would consider it an honor to be a ruler, an honor to be a leader. But times will become so awful, says Isaiah, that people will be afraid of it. They don't want it. You know, sometimes you find that in the church today, that people are so disrespectful to the bishops and the priests and the sisters, to those who are heads of parish councils, to lay leaders who are teachers. People are so disrespectful that people don't even want the job anymore. Look at the problem of declining vocations to the sisterhood. That now it has gotten to a point where people are ashamed to say that they want to become a sister or a priest. And it's because that this, the situation is when it collapse because of our own pride and arrogance perhaps. And we need to get back to the Lord to see what is it the Lord wants. Not what society says. But does the Lord call me? to be a leader, to serve His people, to lay down my life for His folks. Because that's the real call of leadership under Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came not to be served, but to serve others and to give His life as a ransom. But today, people don't want to do that anymore. And they run from it. And it says here in verse 8, the reason why these people don't want to be leaders, because Jerusalem is ruined. Judah is fallen. The city is going to be collapsed on the day of the Lord. I don't want anything to do with it. Leave me alone. Leave me out of this trouble. Leave me out of this religion. It's going to collapse. It's too much bother. Leave me alone. That's what they're saying here. Perhaps like people say today. The look on their faces will witness against them. And they will proclaim their sin like Sodom did. They won't even hide it. Woe to their soul, for they have done great evil to themselves. In other words, the prophet is saying, such people at this time of the day of the Lord will have a look upon them. A look like something they've done is wrong. That they'll know, they'll feel guilty and they'll show on their faces. And they won't even try to hide their sin. Sometimes people do that, don't they? Sometimes they get into the attitude that, well, you know, I did this and who cares if it's wrong? I'm proud of what I did. I'm a sinner. Well, who even wants to call it sin anymore? I'm, I'm going to do what I do and if anybody doesn't like it, they don't have to do it or look at it. But I'm going to do my own thing. And the Lord says, woe to their soul. Woe to them. Oi lenafshim. It's as if, he says, woe, because it's as if they're already dead in spirit. That's why he says, woe. Now, verses 10 and 11 break in here. And Isaiah gives us a saying from wisdom. And he teaches his people some wisdom. Wisdom you and I need to hear. He says, now say to the righteous that it shall be well with him, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. In other words, if you're righteous, you will experience the result of your righteousness, the fruit of your actions, the fruit of your deeds shall come back to you and there will be righteous fruit. The results of your righteous actions will be righteousness for you. Isn't that wonderful? What a wise thing. And maybe we will not see it in this life necessarily, but you and I can be positive, absolutely sure, that the God who is all righteousness will on the day of the Lord, on His day that He calls us home to Himself, give us the fruit, the result of our righteous deeds. And we will love to share in that fruit. As a matter of fact, John in the book of Apocalypse describes that as trees that bear fruit every single month. And we'll be there to eat it. And the leaves on the trees will heal us. So also will the fruit that we have from our righteous deeds nourish us when we see the Lord. And the leaves that flow from it will be like the leaves in the New Jerusalem that will heal us of all the hurts we've experienced. But, Woe to the wicked, it will be evil to him. For the work of his hands shall be done to him. If you're evil, you'll experience the result of your own deeds as evil that destroys you. 
And so therefore, if you're really wise, if you heed this wisdom, you'll forsake evil and choose goodness, righteousness, and not allow an evil end and rotten fruit to follow your life, but rather will allow the fruit of righteousness to be there. And then in verses 12 through 15, the Lord gives His judgment on the government. And this is His judgment. He says, My people, their master is just a suckling baby. A baby who still nurses at the breast. Women shall rule over them. Now this is obviously not a women's lib prophet, huh? And this is a prophet of a long time ago. And women were not allowed to rule in society. And he would consider it something shameful. He says, that's what's going to happen to them. My people, those who lead you cause you to commit error. They cause you to sin. And they destroy the way of your paths. Your leaders are ruining you. The Lord stands up in court. And the Lord stands to judge all the nations, all the peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders of His people, and He will say to its princes, It is you who have eaten up the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. You have crushed my poor. And for that, they shall be punished. We're going to come back in just a minute to continue to see what Isaiah says about that day of the Lord. So please stay with us. Welcome back. Now, if you notice, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 15, we've seen how it has been mainly the men of Judah and Jerusalem that have been addressed. The warriors, the judges, those who do different forms of sorcery. They're the ones who have been attacked because of the unrighteousness, and especially as we saw at the end, because of the way that they mistreat the poor. That's one of the worst things these men have done. They've been unjust to the poor. But now we see the prophet Isaiah turn from the men to the women. So in chapter 3, verses 16 to chapter 4, verse 1, we see that the prophet gives a judgment against the women of Jerusalem, the rich women. And he says... Now, the Yahweh says, because the daughters of Zion are haughty, that is, high lifted up, and they walk with stretched forth necks and with wanton eyes or, or lying eyes, walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Now, what's he describing there? We're not really sure. Is he describing women who are simply arrogant, sort of walking around with their necks out here and so that everybody can see how much jewelry they have up and down their necks? I have lots of gold necklaces on. Don't you like to see that? Women who make, make sure that their earrings are big and gold with jewels on it. And they, and they make tinkling noises with their feet. They have beautiful shoes on. They have all sorts of different things on their, their feet and their ankles to make noise and to make sure people not only see the beauty of their gold and silver jewelry, but they can hear it. In other words, with their wealth, they become something of an environment to make sure everybody looks at them. But not only might it be their arrogance and haughtiness with all of their jewelry, but also perhaps they're being seductive as they look around to see who's looking at them, especially are the men looking at me? And are, the, are, they trying, are these women trying to attract the men? Or maybe these women are doing both, being seductive and also very haughty. So what does the Lord say to them? Therefore, Yah, the Lord will bind the hair. Now, some of your translations will say that he will put scabs on their, on their head. Okay? That's a possible translation. Because the word that we have here, sipach, comes from a word that means scab, perhaps. But also there's another word that means binding the hair. And the reason that it might be binding the hair is that we see from Assyrian records 
that women who were made slaves by the Assyrians and captured from enemy cities had their hair tied up and bound. And now the Lord is saying to these women who walked around so proud and arrogant, without veils, without modesty, showing off their heads, now the Lord will bind them up and make them slaves on the day of His judgment when He destroys the city of Jerusalem so that their punishment will fit their sin. And then in verses 18 to 23, we see sort of the Sears catalog of the ancient world. All the different things women would wear. The different anklets and crescents they'd put on their ears and pendants and bracelets and veils and, and different headdresses and things to put on their arms and sashes around their waists. And, and corslets and little charms that they would wear, little charm bracelets, noses, uh, nose jewels, put little jewels in their noses, earrings and aprons and little head, headdresses to go around their shoulder and these different kinds of necklaces that would be like collars all up and down the neck. All these different things women would love to wear. And what does the Lord say? On that day, Yahweh will take it all away. It will be removed. And in, on that day, it shall happen, in verse 24, that instead of sweet spices, there shall be rottenness. Their wounds will be cut and wounded themselves. And they'll smell badly, instead of swelling from, from perfume. And instead of the girdle, there were rags. Instead of the curled hair, they'll, ha they'll be bald. Because, the, why will they be bald? Because when women mourn their dead, they would shave their hair off. And instead of something to wear around the stomach, they'll be having to wear sackcloth. Now verses 25 to uh, chapter 4 verse 1, then describe what will happen to the women on that day. Their men shall fall by the sword, and their warriors in, in the war, they're going to lose their men and they'll die. And verse 26, her gates shall lament and mourn, that is, the gates of Jerusalem, who seem to be like a woman. And then in verse, chapter 4, verse 1, seven women will take hold of one man and say, marry me, marry me. We'll eat our own bread, we'll do our own work, we'll get our own clothes, anything, just marry me. Because they'll be so alone. And if they're not married, they'll be made slaves. They'll not be able to have children. They'll not have the, the, the light of, of having a family. Things will become as, absolutely desperate. But then we see a change. In chapter 4, verse 2 to 6, we see that there's also on that day, a day of salvation. On that day, the same day as the day of judgment, there shall be the growth of Yahweh, and it will be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the land shall be excellent and beautiful for those who are escaped of Israel. In other words, those who can survive on the day of the Lord will be the righteous. And things will become beautiful for them because on that day the Lord will remove all the idolatry, all the injustice, all the oppression of the poor, all those who are warriors, all those who are corrupt judges and corrupt politicians, all will be removed. Rich, haughty women will be removed. Evil will be destroyed. But on that same day, the righteous instead shall see God's goodness. It shall come to pass, in verse 3, that, all, that the one who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy. The Lord will give them holiness. And also, that the Lord will, get, will wash away the filth. He will purge them. He will cleanse them. He will give them repentance. That's the glory of that day. And the Lord, in verse 5, will create over Zion a cloud to protect them and a light to guide them. That that day of judgment surely will be painful for those who are sinful, but for those who love God. They will experience cleansing, purification, They'll experience a new life because of it, and holiness. And they'll experience God's protection over them. As it says in the book of Revelation, He'll wipe away all their tears and show them His love.